This is just awesome. I am so excited about this. We're going to look at the everlasting covenant and how it's an agreement between father and son. And I'm going to hit a lot of points here. And it's just awesome. This is just absolutely awesome when you start to really dig into this and see how the covenant has only ever been between father and son. And a lot of times we hear about, you know, the old covenant and the new covenant. And I see this as being something where there is a covenant, one singular covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. And it's between God the Father and God the Son. And Jesus came and he fulfilled that for us. And what we have now is the New Testament. And the Testament is an inheritance. So the only thing that we have to do is receive the inheritance which was given to us by Jesus who fulfilled the covenant between him and his Father. It's absolutely incredible. It's amazing. This is just awesome. So we're going to dig in here and we're going to take a look and we're going to start here in Genesis 15 right off the bat where we have a covenant between God and Abram. This is Abram prior to becoming Abraham um, being renamed. That happens in chapter 17. And so we go right in in Genesis 15. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. So this is where God had promised him that he'd be a father. And then he took it upon himself to conspire with Hagar that apparently he didn't believe God was going to give him a, uh, an inheritance through, uh, through uh, Sarah. And so he conspired to have a child with Hagar, and that was Ishmael. So he says, you know, OK, well, I got Ishmael, but you didn't really do anything. That was that was me and Hagar that made that happen. And so. That's why he's saying, one born in my house is my heir. And so verse 4 says, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own vows shall be thine heir. So God's saying, yeah, that thing you did with Hagar, that's not, that's not it. I promised you something, and I'm going to follow through with my promise. And your little thing where you did your thing to circumvent that, not trusting me, that's not what I was talking about. So in verse 5 it says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell, tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So he's telling them, Look up at the stars, and that's how many, that's how big of an impact you're going to have in your lineage. Is, is If you can even attempt to count the number of stars that you see up there, your, your children are going to be your children and your children's children and the generations coming from that is going to exceed that. Verse six, and it says, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So that's a familiar verse. We, we have that referenced multiple times in the New Testament that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's the origin right here in Genesis fifteen six. And verse 7, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So you've got a, he's got a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old male ram, that's a male sheep, and he's got a turtle dove and a pigeon. And these are supposed to be the sacrifices being made that God has told him to prepare. So in verse 10 it says, And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. So he, he slew the heifer and the goat and the ram. And he laid them, laid the pieces down. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Then we see in verse 12, it says, When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. 
And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So what we see here is Abram fell asleep, and now he's having a vision of how those uh, of his lineage are going to be enslaved 400 years in Egypt. But then after that, they're going to return to the land that he's being promised. And so what we see here, though, in verse 12 is that Abram's asleep. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Now we're going to go back to this point when the sun is going down. That's where this next verse picks up. In verse 17, it says, And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark. Okay, when the sun went down, Abram's asleep. So we go, And it came to pass when the sun went down, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So Abram's asleep while a smoking furnace and a burning lamp fulfill this covenant, uh, passing between the pieces of, of flesh that are sacrificed to make this covenant. And so what we have is the furnace is God the Father, and the lamp is God the Son. So right here, when this covenant is being made, Abram's out cold, having a vision about the Jews being in Egypt for 400 years. And God the Father and God the Son are making a covenant. So just think about that. For the, the, Abram was asleep. He did nothing. God the Father and God the Son passed between those pieces. And so then it says in verse 18, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And the seed is Jesus. The covenant is between God and Jesus. So what we look at here is to just confirm that this is a covenant. That what's being referenced here is the smoking furnace and the burning lamp is God the Father and God the Son. And so we go to Genesis, or Exodus, rather, uh, chapter 19, and in verse 18 it says, And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. So here it is. We've got Mount Sinai, and it's des described as the smoke of a furnace. And we see that the Lord came down upon Mount, Mount Sinai. We know that God is a consuming fire. Um, and that's mentioned several, several times in the Bible, that God is a consuming fire. So here's God, who is the smoking furnace. And then we see... Here in 2 Samuel 22, it says, For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. In Psalms 12, 6 and 7, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So again, we see that the words of the Lord are pure words tried in a furnace. So it continues this uh, characterization where God is a consuming fire and Jesus is a lamp. And we see in Psalms 119, 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And then we know that in John 1, we, it tells us that Jesus is the word. So if Jesus is the word, Jesus is the lamp. Jesus is that burning lamp. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And we jump to verse 10, and it says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And in verse 14, we finally tie it all together and hit the home run. And it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. So there it is. It ties it together. The word was God, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That means the word is Jesus. The word is Jesus. We go backwards. The word is a lamp. Jesus is the lamp. So when we go back to Genesis 15 here, 
And we take a look at that verse and it says that uh, in verse 17, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark and Abram was asleep, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying unto thy seed, which is Jesus, have I given this land from the river of Egypt into the great river, the river Euphrates. So this covenant has always been between God the Father and God the Son. It never involved anyone else. Right from the beginning, we see that is who this covenant is. Now, here's another interesting thing. When we go and we look back that in verse 10, it tells us the birds he divided not. The birds were, in verse 9, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Okay, so what's that all about? That piqued my interest. Why didn't they do this? This is because this is being put off till later to further prove who it is, the seed, that this verse is about. So if we go to Leviticus chapter 12, we see the law regarding this issue. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a male child, then shall she be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And so she has to continue the process of being uh, made clean. And at ver verse 6 it says, When the days of her purif purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove. So here we have a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest. And the priest who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath born a male or female. Also notice here that the priest is the one who makes atonement and Jesus is the high priest. So it's the priest who makes the atonement. In verse 8, it says, and if she be not able to bring a lamb, okay, because in verse 6, it said you have to bring a lamb and a young pigeon or a turtle dove. But now here's an exception. If she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons. So you can bring two turtle doves or two pigeons instead of a lamb and a turtle dove and a, or a pigeon. The one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. So one is a burnt offering, one is the sin offering. That's why you have to bring two. And the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. So this is the law regarding circumcision, uh, the purifying of the mother, and the offerings that need to be brought. And you notice that the offering is that you can bring two turtle doves and two pigeons, or two, two pigeons. And what was not offered were the two birds. So now we go to Luke 2. And we look at, starting in verse 21, and it says, And when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, that's Mary, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So that's what we're seeing here when we go back to Genesis 15 and verse 9. And it says that they had a, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. But they didn't divide the birds. They were holding that off until Jesus was born. So just think about that. That was that was held off till Jesus was born because the covenant was between God and Jesus. So the covenant wasn't fulfilled until these birds were were sacrificed. And that's just that just blows my mind right there. So <laughs> So the covenant has always been between God the Father and God the Son, and Jesus came and he fulfilled that for us. And that's just the only part that we have is we're, we are now the recipients of an inheritance of a contract that's already been fulfilled by somebody on our behalf as our substitute so that we don't have to do it. And all we have to do is just believe that and receive it. And it's just amazing 
I mean, that's why the good news is good news. So we're going to look here. This this is an interesting circular uh, way of finding things that I ended up coming across that I just thought about how, you know, this this part here at the beginning of the chapter, it says that he's our exceeding great reward. And there were a couple references to that. And so I went to Isaiah 62, 11 here. And actually, we start in verse 10. And it says, go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. So look at this, what, what this is saying. His reward is with him. We receive an inheritance and his work is before him. It's his work. We receive the reward of his work. This is just incredible. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called sought out, a city not forsaken. And here's where this attracted my attention. They shall be called, thou shalt be called sought out. So what is sought out? What sought out is incredibly continues to tie in with this. It says in Isaiah 40, 10, Behold, the Lord God will come to you with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. That's the same phrasing. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom, seeking them out. They are sought out, and shall gently lead those that are with young. And then finally, what do we see here? In Luke 15, Starting in verse 3, and he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? They shall be called sought out. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise, Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.